Hello, everybody. Welcome to another thought-provoking episode of Club Moffat Talks. I am your host, one of our instruction librarians at the Moffat Library, Chris DiPanetta. And I'm Joseph McNeely, and I'm also an instruction librarian. And I'm Ryan Samuelson. I am the Associate University Librarian for Public Services. All right, and joining us today, we have Jason Weber. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, so I'm Jason Weber. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Leader and Culture Development at the uh, Texas Tech System Office. Wonderful. It's very nice to meet you. We're really excited to have you on today. Uh, before we get into really the meat of the podcast, we're going to just go around and talk about uh, just what we've been doing lately, just, you know, to kind of humanize us so that the listeners know that we actually do things. We do it mostly to geek out. Let's, let's be honest about it. Who wants to go first this time? You always have nothing to say, Ryan. So why don't you go ahead and start first? Okay, I, I, will, I will say that I am enjoying the second season of Strange New Worlds. How about that? Okay, that that's fair. <laughs> uh, I've I've started watching next seasons and final seasons of of various things. Um, there's there's some shows that. I know have already dropped episodes that I haven't started watching again yet. Uh, I had enjoyed the first season of the TV series of Lincoln Lawyer, and I know that it's dropped new episodes on, I believe it's on Netflix, uh, but I haven't started that yet. The last season of uh, Jack Ryan has dropped. The last season of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel has dropped, uh, and, and we haven't begun watching those yet. Uh, we did watch all of the episodes that ha have dropped of The Witcher, um, but yeah, there's there's still stuff out there that we that we want to want to watch. Um, and I am reading. I finished The Witcher series, and as I had said, I was going to do. I have uh, started reading the uh, uh, Jim Butcher uh, Dresden Files books. I'm just about to finish the second one. I guess I should mention that I, one of the classes I'm co-teaching this. Semester, my co-teacher added three new books, which I ordered this week and should come in either today or tomorrow. So I'll be reading those probably the rest of the summer because I would like to actually read the books the class is going to be covering before the class begins, I guess. Yeah. Seems wise. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I haven't been doing a whole lot. I've fallen down a really weird arcade rabbit hole lately. I, I don't know why. Like all the big video game releases that i've actually been interested in this year have kind of come and gone and i just i just got this weird thought in my head like you haven't played ghosts and goblins all the way through you know and i'm like oh yeah been meaning to do that so jumped on that and then it's got me like well you know i haven't played golden axe in a while i haven't played final fight in a while and it's just all these arcade games that i've grew up on that I that I have a real special place in my heart for that I either haven't played in a long time or never actually finished and it just won't like it just just keeps adding stuff on like well you don't have a whole lot to do lately in your in your very small amount of free time so that's kind of what these arcade games were designed for just little little bursts of play so yeah why don't you, why don't you enjoy that and um so that's that's been a really strangely nostalgic uh thing that i've been interested in lately um decided to watch the original godzilla with my daughter the other day she's uh she's 18 months old so that was fun uh she kept yelling at godzilla and oh no and, and no through the entire movie so um <laughs> a lot of my family members told me that that was uh inappropriate for for her for her age and i told them there's a lot of Godzilla over the, the past uh, almost 70 years now, and we got to start sometime. <laughs> uh, anything else? I don't think anything. I got something for you, Chris, that, uh, yeah. that, uh, that I forgot to mention to you this week. Um, SF Debris, the, the, the YouTube commenter, mm -hmm. is very insightful science fiction insights into various in, uh, sci-fi media, yeah. is taking on Gundam. So I know... I, I had recently unsubscribed for them, but uh, that reminds me, I well, I need to check that out, but that reminds me, uh, the Tempest adaptation that Gundam did is now over, 
I haven't read The Tempest or seen any versions of it. From what I understand, it is a very modern take on The Tempest. Um, really, kind of kind of interested in uh, doing a little comparison there and seeing how they how they both turn out. Well, I know um, what you're really going to do. You're going to get hold of Peter Fields, who's teaching The Tempest in the fall, am, and you're trying yes. to convince him to watch the entire season of this. I won't convince him to, but I will say here are some things that that seem shakespearean to me and we'll, we'll see where it goes from there yeah. uh that's it for me uh jason you want to talk about some of the things that you've been kind of kind of working on lately yeah so you know we've um well i mean just outside of work stuff so my wife and her sisters are um taking a vacation so they're in italy and oh Nice. Um, the first time she's ever gone, so I've been able to enjoy it via the pictures. Unfortunately, and, uh, it's a bad time. From what I hear, they're going through a huge heat wave right now. Well, you know, and that's what she was saying is it was pretty warm, but uh, um, they've loved everything that they've experienced. So it's been wonderful to see that. And so, you know, trying to keep the kids alive and, you know, make sure things get done. So. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, that's, that's been my life, but otherwise, you know, it's in the free time. It really has been, you know, trying to get into shows or even rewatch some older ones. And, and of course, when I can, I'm a big fan of the, uh, original NES and, and getting, getting into those games. So when that came out, the little mini one with all mm -hmm. those preloaded games, I was, um, I was all over that. So, um, Yeah. We've got one of those in our collection here, actually. Uh, that the previous media librarian she bought that the SNES Mini. Um, I'm still kind of scratching my head about what we can do with those, but yeah, I love those things. They're they're so they're so fun. They're so cool. Yeah. See, I was a big Genesis fan back in the day, and so I know they came out with one of those. Never haven't gotten my hands on it, but that was it for me. That's what that's what I loved growing up. Me too, actually. Then that's that's something we've got in common. Then I was a Genesis person too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're we're pong generation. <laughs> <laughs> you no, laugh. I actually started the first playing game um, was pong that I had. In my house. Yeah, <laughs> I actually started playing Pac Man recently too. Hmm. Pac Man and a a very specific port of Tetris. Like it's so hard to find a a perfect port of Tetris these days. It's just like no fluff or whatever. So, hmm. um, and also Tetris was one of my first games that I ever played too. And yeah, that's um. Yeah, God, I love that game. But Pong, kind of, well, kind of outside of my wheelhouse. <laughs> you know, find and finding them too that aren't the remakes. Mm -hmm. That's the hard thing. You know, it's like you look at the Pac Man, you look at Tetris, you look at you know all these others, and they do these remakes, and it's like, eh, I don't know. So it's hard to get back into them. You know, that was what that was what got me with Ghosts and Goblins recently, where there's a Nintendo version, and then there's the old arcade version, mm -hmm. and there are just certain ways that like um monsters will appear on screen or they'll have like specific placements for like score pickups and stuff and also the arcade version looks a lot better but it's just little things like that where i'm like it's, there's just something like i'm looking for a very specific port of that game and i like <laughs> it's not gonna do if, if it's if it's off a little bit did you see those uh the the new multiplayer tetris and um pac-man and stuff where like you're playing against like a hundred other people yeah that stuff so that that's actually really fun actually yeah should be told <clears throat> that, that sounds terrifying it is people are a lot better at tetris than i think you realize because it's 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 nuts so, Jason, you're from Texas Tech. Did you want to talk a little bit about what um, you do over there? Because I know Joe Joe was telling me a little bit about um, some of the programs that you run over there, and we're, we're really hoping to, to hear about that today. Yeah, so, you know, our office, uh, Leader in Culture Development, is a newly created office. I came over June of last year from the Health Sciences Center, and uh, part of me coming over was to... Uh, do what I've done really at my last three jobs, which is build leader development programs. And so with the system, uh, one of the things that we're really focused on is this enterprise collaboration. And so I really have the privilege of working with MSU, with ASU, El Paso, 
TTU, HSC, and then our system team here. So I get the luxury of being able to go all over and create programs that are going to be unique and beneficial. So um, obviously, I've got my ASU. I realized when we started, I should have worn an MSU shirt, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but you know, we've started a student leader development program at ASU for our students. Uh, we're going to be piloting a faculty and staff program. And, you know, when we get those up and running, I want to be able to take those and bring them to MSU. I mean, that's our next plan. And of course, with um, President Haney coming aboard, you know, getting connected with her when she um, arrives and, you know, just establish her vision so we can determine when the best time would be. But uh, really, again, we get to uh, do the leader development. We get to support the values. So at each of the universities, the values-based culture, um, obviously with MSU, you all have your, I've got it right here. Um, you know, you've got your, your field guide. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the President's Academy. Um, but again, we're going to be revisiting that, updating that for uh, President Haney and, and making sure that we're in, we're in line with her. But, you know, really being able to find ways that we can encourage it. You know, we, we've seen so much value. And, you know, when I, when I came to Texas in 2019, um, it was to the health sciences center and, you know, the values culture had started, it would, it had started about a year, year and a half before me. Um, but they were at the point now of building programs when, which brought me down here. And, uh, we've just seen so much success with that and finding ways to, you know, integrate it into hiring, into how we do reviews, how we make decisions, all of that. So that's a big part of it. Uh, we also, I'm also a certified executive coach. Um, and so I work with leaders at each of our universities as an executive coach. And so um, my interest areas are really around team effectiveness. And so how can we help teams, you know, work uh, better, right? And develop those effective workplace relationships and um, establish that framework so they can be successful. And then we uh, just kind of a little pet project. We've got our podcast. And so we do a Creating Us podcast. And that is, um, it started at the Health Sciences Center, something I'd always wanted to do. I love doing, you know, the podcasting and all of that. I just think it's so much fun. And we started it with kind of a review of the values and the values culture at the Health Sciences Center. When I moved over to the system, I had asked if, you know, they wanted to continue with that and keep it HSC focused, or if, should I bring it with me to the system and then we're going to expand it and make it available to uh, everyone. And they were like, you know, bring it with you, keep us, you know, kind of in the loop as we're going. And we've had the opportunity over the last year to work with Randy Connolly, Ken Blanchard Company, um, and their book. The uh, Simple Truths of Leadership. This is a, a book, again, that we've been studying for the last year, and we just wrapped up and published our final episode on this yesterday. And so now we are putting together kind of a plan where we're going to um, reach out to the campuses. Uh, I really want to start highlighting all the great things that are going on um, at ASU, at MSU in El Paso, because uh, people don't know, right? Um, yeah. You know, building that enterprise connection uh, takes time. And uh, we just have a lot of really cool things on the horizon, which I'm happy to talk about if appropriate. And, um, but that's just a little bit of what, what we get to do. Working with the value values-based culture uh, with a multitude of organizations, what, what are, I, I know that each organization is a little different, but mm -hmm. uh, are there a few that are really overlapping that you see every campus does this one? You know, when the values were started in regards to doing value summits, um, they were started when Steve Sosland uh, joined and Steve is our vice chancellor. So um, he's my boss um, at the at the system, but he has really inspired and led that that push and the essence behind it. And this leads me into kind of answering your question is we don't want to create a value system that leadership comes up with. 
It needs to be something that our team members um, are able to come up with. And we don't want to start with anything and give them where it must have this or this or this. So when we go through the summits, it's a day and a half of team members, community members. That's one of the really fun things we've been able to do is integrate community members as well, where we can talk about what are the key things? You know, what, what does it mean to us? What does MSU mean to us? And we just start brainstorming. We come up with different ideas and then we'll narrow them down, uh, take it you know, overnight and then come back the next day with some new ideas and then we really refine it. We put an icon with it uh, or whatever the university wants. And then after that, we take it to the rest of the campus community and say, hey, this is what we came up with. What do you think? Do you like it? Do we need to change? Do we need to modify? And that has really encouraged this sense of ownership and commitment. And as we look at the values at MSU and ASU, El Paso, HSC, TTU in the system, unintentionally, there are several that connect. Um, the most connected is people first. You know, the ability for us to build our family, right, as an MSU family. And, uh, you know, when we look at specifically what uh, you all have in yours, um, I'll share with you some of the key connections that we have. But obviously, people centered is your first one, right? And so that ability to, hey, we've got to put our people first, our students first, you know, that's who we're here for. Um, community is another big one. And this could look like a lot of different things, but the sense of breaking down silos and barriers and creating that space where everyone can collaborate, share ideas, et cetera. Um, integrity, you'll find that in every one of the universities. Visionaries, another one, and then connections. You know, they're called a little bit, something a little bit different, you know, but the reality is, again, without us sitting there saying, make sure you have this and make sure you have that, it just really organically came together. And I think that's what's been so fun mm -hmm. is as we work with each of the universities, there's a lot of connection. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to really uh, leverage that. How much of your, of these committees that you usually see are student focused, staff focused, like that's the majority of what their, um, their layout looks like? Yeah, so we try to integrate all um, in what we're doing. So faculty, staff, leaders, community, and students. Um, in regards to the programming that we're building, uh, we want to be able to show that we have development opportunities for our students. Uh, we're starting with juniors. Uh, and so our programs are re revolve around juniors, knowing that we can take a semester, work with them, uh, provide them executive coaches, uh, which we can talk about as well. And then we have that opportunity for them as seniors to be able to mentor freshmen and sophomore. Pairing that, we're also creating, you know, leadership series for students so that each year throughout, they're able to have something. Mm -hmm. Then with our faculty and staff, again, we want to be able to create opportunities where, yes, we can focus in on that level or that grouping of team members, but we also do our webinars and our podcasts, and those are intended to include everyone. Um, they're open to the public. You go to our website, it's all open to the public. We don't lock it down. And that's intentional because, again, we want to be able to share what it is that we're doing because we believe in it. But two, I think it, it helps show um, that connectedness that we have. And, you know, when I look at the data after our webinars, um, you know, we when we started, it was heavy HSC because, well, people knew me. And so I came over here and so they were going to continue joining it. But as we've been able to slowly start getting the word out, um, we're now seeing a higher volume of MSU, right? MSU and ASU have been leading the way recently and then El Paso as well. So it's been great to see it spread, um, but we have a lot more room. So we can definitely include more individuals. Uh, what what is the executive coaching? How how does that work? 
So one of the one of the resources that's been you know in the organizational development field and um, leader field, it's it's been you know really picking up this idea of a coach. A coach is someone who can come alongside a leader um, or an individual who has a desire to self reflect and grow. And I can come alongside them. We talk about what are things that you're doing that are going well? What are things that aren't going well? What challenges are you facing? How would you respond to that? And so coaching is an opportunity for me to be a neutral party, to provide critical questioning and guidance uh, through the lens of you're the best judge of the actions and behaviors that you take. So coaching is not um, advising or uh, consulting, you know, in an advising or consulting role, I'm coming in telling you, hey, you're going to want to do this, you're going to want to do that. With coaching, instead, I want to be able to empower you and I want to be able to have a conversation and I want your insights because, you know, what happens anytime somebody says, hey, I want you to go do this and it fails? You look at that person and go, you didn't know what they were talking about, right? They told me to. Coaching is really that opportunity to provide that space to reflect and say, okay, I responded in this way, probably should have responded in this way. Okay, so next time you face it, what are you going to do? What are the key things that you can think about? And so when I work with leaders, whether it's, um, you know, we, it could be executives, it could be faculty, it could be staff, I've got some students, um, et cetera, you know, it's, it's navigating you know, our map of the world. It's, it's navigating life. And so it's an opportunity to, to really kind of reflect and what is it that you want? You know, what are the outcomes that you are going for? And then how do you get there? So my role is really to kind of be that question asker, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, be that person who can challenge you, but also support you along the way. Okay. It makes it seem very organic too. It's like the growth is kind of internal and it just grows mm -hmm. from there. Once you give them the ability to see how that, that coaching works, it's, it's, it's easy to spread almost. You know, many times uh, the pace of change and just the pace of how things get done is crazy fast, right? We can become, we kind of get into a rut at times where, all right, I come into work, I know what to, to expect, I've got these problems, let me put these fires out and go from there. Mm -hmm. And then what are some of the common things that we hear? Well, I don't have time for this stuff, or I'm really stressed out, I don't have that work-life balance, and I don't have this or that. Many times what we come to find, though, is we're doing it to ourselves, you know, we're not placing the appropriate boundaries, we're not delegating when we should, we're not... Um, saying no enough, right? And because we're so quick to be like, yes, we got to be a part of that. So it's really an opportunity to say, all right, let's pull out of that, that fast pace that you're going. And let's just take a look. Do you like where you're at? What would you change? What would you do different? What do you think the outcome would be? What are you willing to try? So again, it is, it's that empowerment because if we were to approach it where Jason says, do this, that's gonna wear out. And then what happens if our relationship fizzles out or I leave or something, right? Then what happens? You know, I don't wanna create people that rely on me. I wanna be able to help develop individuals that are empowered, that know what questions to ask so that they can kind of create that space where they can challenge themselves to make sure that they're performing in a way that works the best for them. It's very close to what our uh, our mission statement is. It's um, empower our students so that they can learn and find the answers on their own. So really what we do is we give them that push at least for the library, that's that's what our big yeah. goal is. Um, so something that I was wondering, since you do speak to uh, quite a few different universities and, and campuses, um, the other day I was um, looking at the ACRL, the academic college library thing, uh, for their top trends that are happening right now in the libraries. And a lot of them I noticed, you see a lot of those like post-COVID, there's like there's a kind of an anxiety going around. There's a, a higher trend in 
uh, staff changes and all this other stuff. Do you see any very consistent changes that have happened or trends that have happened in the last few years, especially in that regard? Absolutely. I think the one thing that suffered the most was relationships. Um, I would say 90% of the guidance I provide or training and development that I provide is rooted in developing relationships. Um, I think the pushing everybody remote with COVID, you know, that was the right decision, right? We did what we did, but it isolated a lot of people. Um, and I think as for many leaders and, and many individuals, they didn't know how to function and operate in that space. Higher education doesn't do a lot. I mean, there is remote, you know, in higher ed, higher ed, but at least for our system, that wasn't super common. Um, many individuals that I spoke to were like, I've never done that, right? And so we had to figure it out. Well, what happened is we started seeing responses such as if your Skype indicator does not stay green, you're obviously not working. And we would have leaders who would, they would manage based off of that. Mm -hmm. We would have leaders who would require certain things. And so we saw trust diminish. We saw capability diminish. And I think we had to, there was a lot of guesswork. And I don't ever want to say that a leader's response is right or wrong. Sure, there are examples we can give, but I think we have to be able to look at what did they know? How were they developed? Um, you know, many times when I talk to these leaders who are like, if they're not green, they're not working. Or if they're not sitting in their seat, they're not working. It's like, well, where did that come from? And so part of what we're, what we do is we want to be able to share, you know, kind of that knowledge of, you know, don't get caught up in these things. Um, you know, I don't think people want to be micromanaged like that. You know, why, why did it go yellow? What are you doing? Right. And then you see online all these examples where people are taping things to their mouse to keep it moving. Right. I mean, you see all these different <laughs> ways to get around it, but as we've come back, I think I think one of the issues that we are seeing is leaders made the assumption and team members made the assumption that when we come back to work, we're just going to pick up and carry on. And that's not the case. We really had to start over. Um, I mean, you think about the impact that that had and the ripple effect is we've had to focus heavily on communication change, how to deal with change, trust, dealing with conflict, um, effective management styles. I mean, so some may argue and say, oh, those are basic. Well, I believe that we need to get back to the basics, right? We get so caught up in stuff. Let's go back and remind ourselves. It's not about me teaching you something new. It's more about how can we remind ourselves these are the key things that we need to be doing. Yeah, and I can especially see that as coaching being so people oriented and and focused on actual discussion and uh, getting to know people, having to go from in person to learning all of that again, so that we're all still communicating and we're still learning from each other, uh, but remotely and we're not actually talking to each other. Then to have to go right back to what we were doing, yeah, that that seems like that would have been a immensely challenging and. Also, yeah, I, I had a cousin had I have a cousin who works uh, for the Atlanta Braves. And yeah, they were uh, they were saying that his uh, VPN would show like if if you were away for even a, a tiny amount of time, like they would time you and just say like you were off the clock for this amount of time, no matter what is it was it was a really weird situation for a lot of people. You know, it's that right there hits at the integrity, right? I think, you know, we know this, we see this is that the majority of people out there, they want to do the right thing. And I don't think there were clear expectations set um, because I don't think we knew this hit so fast and mm -hmm. it was life altering, right? Um, you know, it was, uh, it really was transformational. But again, when we come back, you know, we still see, you know, leaders that even today are like, why is your Skype yellow? right? You should be working. And it's just like, 
we, we can't lead that way. Um, you know, we want to be trusted. We want to be, you know, given opportunity to, um, you know, make mistakes and learn from it and move forward. But it seems like there's been a lot less tolerance for that. And so I think it's been trying to rebuild that. And so, you know, I think even too, with our students, you know, what we're seeing is, right. you know, why look at what they missed. You know, I, I was having a conversation with someone a while back and, so my kids, my oldest is uh, 17. He's about to be a senior. And, you know, I think about those students who missed their junior and senior year because they were remote. You know, think about all the experiences, you know, conflict and friendships and you just working through life as they're growing up. Well, now they're coming to college and we're now being we're the ones that are responsible for helping them navigate these life changes. And we're seeing it in the classroom. Why are students doing this? Why are students doing that? And so we have to remind ourselves that for many of them, and they're still there, they're still in our universities, right? Uh, we're not far enough out yet where we can say we've cycled through it, but it's that responsibility. And that's why we're seeing all these differences. I think people are still just trying to figure out how do we navigate it, right? I know our biggest problem in post-COVID has been the fact that faculty for a year did without the library. And so a lot of them are still at that point, like, why do we still need the library? Yeah. We're saying that with a lot of instruction that we're, usually the professor would request that we teach their class something. And we've seen a, a few professors turn around and say, well, well, I could just do that. I'll, I'll book your computer lab and... I'll go in and I'll teach in, instead. And um, that's, I mean, you know, the lab is is for you to use. That's fine. But at the same time, like there are nuances and, and that's, those are things that not only do we want to show the students how to use that, we also want to keep the faculty and staff kind of in, in the know of what things might've changed or, or what, uh, what policies we might've made a little different like especially this last year we completely changed our our catalog like our entire system changed and that would have probably led to some confusion if some people weren't ready to have that shift as well oh and just a quick thing um just to change topic for a second what this this talk has reminded me of something um uh chris i have um four dozen supposedly top papers for the uh, the award stuff we're doing, did you want those to go see and see how many people actually were using like Google Scholar instead no, of using the databases don't. we're using? No, I, I my heart couldn't take that. <laughs> I, I know, but it might be it might be a good thing to to show the faculty, hey, you think you're doing a good job teaching these students and what they need to use as yeah, far as databases are, but you're really not. That's a really great point. And some of them might be saying like, oh, you can start at Google Scholar for your for your instruction or for or like finding your references and stuff where where we would say if there's absolutely nothing that you can do to find your source then maybe turn to google scholar because it's going to be very broad but uh yeah that's that's just one of those things where like it there are things about the library that being inside the library you really have to see it happening before you can like kind of adjust to that change yourself and this last well, and, semester in particular. You know, and that's just it. I, I think of even of my students, you know, and we talk about these fundamental things, APA or MLS or whatever it is that you use to write. But, you know, it, having those resources, I think back to when I was a faculty member and, you know, I leaned heavily on our library to help, you know, instruct on the APA and the nuances there. It's not just about make sure your citation looks right or make sure, you know, this. I mean, there's a lot more that goes to it. And, um you know, it, it's difficult. I see it now, even with my students where it's like, oh, yeah, you need some, <laughs> you definitely need some help with that. But how do we do that? Right. And if we don't have those effective partnerships, then again, I think it's, you know, we need to be able to realize the the knowledge and the expertise that's here to be able to really enhance the experience of our students. Now, one thing I'm curious about, I'm going to kind of flip the script here and ask okay, you all. Go ahead. So, AI. I, you know, I don't know much 
um, about it. You know, chat GPT, I know is a big thing. And there are some people I that are, you know, I associate with that are into that type of thing. But as it relates to higher education, like with students, um, what are you all seeing? And what are your thoughts on either the advantages or disadvantages of, of running that? I just, I find it so curious when I read through papers and stuff, and I don't want to be critical of my students. But um, at the same time, it's like, how easy is it, though, to go and get that? I don't know. Uh I've actually talked to a number of professors about that, so I think I'll lead in on that. Uh, first off, to begin with, we did talk about ChatGT extensively in one of our um, podcasts about four or five months ago. So, something like that. For those of you watching this podcast, go back and watch that podcast. Oh, go back. Yeah. <laughs> Not don't stop this one. Just you know, <laughs> keep it in mind. Um, but one of the things I'm finding is a lot of the professors think that the at least what our university is starting to do is they have software to check to see if it is AI. And they're just accepting that, which is wrong. Um, there was a study that came out, uh, I think this week or last week, which said that, for instance, um, 30 to 50% of non-primary English speakers, where English is a second language, have a false positive when it comes to, um, to AI um, um, generated uh, content. And I had a professor who was talking about that. He said, yes, I had a student come in that was that had been in it for another professor had had basically had come up as as a as a um as a false positive. He was sure that he had been a false positive. And his his dad came and goes, I watched him do that um report. I know for a fact that he wrote that himself. But just because of the way his cadence and the way he did things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they found out also is if there used to be a thing called summary where you you take or paraphrasing. Paraphrasing will also result in a false positive mm -hmm. because it's taking something um, that somebody has found off the internet. And if you paraphrase it, that's exactly what the chat um, uh, chat GT will do as well. It mm -hmm. will paraphrase stuff that's on the internet. So it will also, that will also trigger a false positive. And I've spoken, something. I've spoken to professors here on, on our campus who have said, I prefer paraphrasing for my, like for my papers, whenever I see a student come in with, uh, with their own papers, I almost like ninety percent want to see them paraphrase whatever citation or whatever quote that they're doing. I don't want to see direct quotes. I want to see them be able to put that quote into their own words. So yeah. that makes it even more muddled and even more confused. And I know there are professors on campus who have a no, I mean it's it's a very strict policy. If the if the computer program says that you use an AI, you fail. You mm -hmm. fail the class. And I know there are false positives on that. I know that the software, no software is perfect. Yeah. And so um there's gonna be a meeting. I know there's a committee here on campus that just formed to cover this sort of things. One of the faculty members said you should be on the committee, Ryan. Unfortunately, I was not invited to the committee. Um, but again, that's one of the problems is they think that a lot of times they think a lot of times they're professors who don't understand AI. They're not computer science uh, scientists. And so they think technology caused this problem. Technology can solve this problem. And it's not that easy. Yeah. Um, the one class I am doing, I know for a fact, um, because the formatting is such templated, all that um, an AI could do was improve the grammar, basically, mm -hmm. if they follow that which I view is perfectly fine. It's a tool, especially if you're if you're a Chinese student who just started learning English maybe five years ago or three years ago. Something like that is a godsend to help you help you improve how you're doing your paper. But so many of the faculty members viewed it as the end of everything, the end of academia, the, the thing that needs to be struck up against. And the thing we came up on our in our in our webinar said it is a tool. It is one other tool out there. And it's going to take a while for us to figure out how to use that tool correctly and how to safeguard against that tool, but there are ways of doing that. And it's going to require more work on the part of the faculty, which they may push back against as well. Anyway, you know, those are my thoughts. Of, well, you know, and, and thank you for that. You know, one of the positive um, opinions that I've heard and, and I agree with personally is I think there's an opportunity there with it, right? I mean, because the technology is there and and it's, it's how we want to leverage it. But, you know, it goes back to, uh, Chris, what you were saying is, how can we then um, how can we then apply it 
So fine, you know, go and get that information, but I want to be able to see you apply it. I want to hear in your words, right? And so I think there is an opportunity there where we can really take advantage of it. Um, But again, I don't have a deep understanding of it. I just know it's rapidly, I mean, it's all over. And so I I just am curious to see how how our institutions are going to respond. Now, there are some ways to overcome it. Um, Oral exams might come back in style. Which um, actually, that was that was something in, in the class that I'm taking right now, and I, I'm sorry, I'm I'm going to end up speaking really quickly because I have to bounce here in a, a few minutes. I got to help out with some things outside. But one of the things we were talking about was um, was just that, like the rise of YouTube as an academic uh, resource. Where this paper was written in 2013, and they were talking about it being a new thing in the last decade. And now we can see it's like it's ubiquitous pretty much. And the way that like YouTube essays are presented, they're they're kind of more like consumer focused basically, but there's still there's still merit in the fact that people can edit what would be uh, a paper themselves. Like the only difference is that they would have their own cadence, they would have their own voice. But like Ryan said, yeah, you could say without without a shadow of a doubt, you can look at a a moving image of a person and say like that's that's someone talking. There's it, it would be very arguable to see that an AI made this. And like there are videos right now of uh, it's like um, <laughs> one of them was Conan O'Brien gets in a car crash and eats spaghetti, and it was like a video of like an AI. It was like. It looked like it was like this car flipping and it turned into flesh and then something that looked like Conan O'Brien coming out of it. And like just the way that they make these images, it's like there's nobody on planet Earth is going to look at that and and think for a second like this might be fake. Just because it's like those things are like they're very obvious. But yeah, with something like like writing, though, that's where it gets really weird. And uh, a friend of mine who works in computer science had told me that. Um, the GPT-3 model is actually not as robust as we might think it is. Because for now, we get the idea that like we see a, a chat prompt and it'll like someone will say, like, write us write a whole book about this thing, and it'll come up and it'll look, you know, it, it looks like it's written correctly, the syntax is fine, the the ideas are generic and boring, but it's still a, a written thing. Same thing with like uh, AI art or whatever. Like you can see some things like the hands might look weird, but it looks like a human could have drawn it, a particularly um, unmotivated or uh, boring person might've made it, but it it still looks like you can make the argument for it. What this friend of mine told me was that um, studies have been shown that these models can only take like five to 10 prompts. And it's because they're actually hundreds of these gpt models that are mashed together and they have someone someone whoever is watching their servers or whoever is like watching the you know the the prompts go by who can see hundreds of potential versions of these uh these script models and have to say like uh these are all junk they're they're barely legible let's go with this one and have the computer go from there and just continue to build off of those models that they think are working and over time you can you can have those those same chatbots and and ai or whatever so that they they don't have to have that that same amount of oversight and some of the older ones where it would just be like you would say something and it would say something back that doesn't uh, that obviously doesn't need as much oversight but as we get more sophisticated deep learning suddenly they're not learning on their own they're having to have a person there saying uh this is what you need to like this is the response you need to make and they're not learning on their own so that's really what's what's going to be interesting about these models coming up is how much of it is literally a person who is having to correct the ai to say this is what needs to be correct and this is this is what we're really doing because then then it's a collaboration. Then it's a collaborative effort between the AI and another person. So that's that's just my thoughts on this whole thing. It's it's really muddled and really confusing right now, but it's it's definitely not going away anytime soon. That's the yeah. the unfortunate part of it is that it's just going to keep getting more confusing over time. 
And Chris, it's a quarter tail, so um, go turn into a pumpkin. Yep. All right, uh, Jason, it was very, very nice to meet you. I've seen your name in our uh, emails from time to time, and now I'm really glad that I have a, a face and a voice to put to those. And I'm I'm just super glad that you've uh, come on here and been able to to talk with us about your, your uh, programs that you're doing. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. It was nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Everyone else, I'll see you in the next one. All right. See you, Chris. Another thing I was going to suggest as well is maybe in-class essays. Yeah. Uh, but Chris wanted to talk about it. There are ways around it. There are ways around it. I think a lot of times is faculty get used to doing it a certain way, which is easiest for them to some, to some extent. Um, grading papers, as much as they complain about it, there is a template to it. There is a rhythm to it. There is a way to 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 do that. That it's going to be almost standardized across their way of doing a rubric mm -hmm. to grade those type of things. When you start doing oral essays, when you start doing um, in class essays, which is a way of of, of, of getting of, of completely um, removing the artificial the artificial AI mm -hmm. system, um, I think for them it's a little bit more scary because it's something they hit me never done or it's something that's been a long time since they have done mm -hmm. and so i think there's a there's a there's there is a hesitation on the faculty to try different ways to overcome this they prefer just to run everything through a computer system and have something pop that says this was done by ai when we know for a fact that it that doesn't really work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i think that the ai is an interesting problem uh, a thing that I've noticed is, is that it there there seems to be a, a pretty steep gradient on the uh, productivity or or the seeming authenticity of the work that they produce. Uh, I know that Chris said something about uh, in the art world where figures that an AI has produced may have more than five fingers on their hands, may have more than two arms, may have more than two legs, or, or some things like that that are kind of obvious. And I have seen the AI-generated artwork that looks like that. On the other hand, when I look at AI-generated artwork that is just scenic, uh, a landscape or even a cityscape uh, with, you, you don't have that. You don't have those obvious things that like no human would have made this. Mm -hmm. You look at it and go, wow, that's a great piece of art. And it's like, oh, well, Siri made that. I never would have known, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and similarly with other things, uh, with the writing and with uh, audio, I was playing with the thing for something that I was working on here for an announcement that I wanted to do that I didn't want to use any of our voices for. So I was playing with AI voiceovers where you can submit a script and this computer reads it for you. Hmm. And what I found with that was that there's a wide range of those. There are ones that sound like Hal from Space Odyssey, or that you know have that 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 very monotone, robotic sound, but there are other ones that sound like a person, and not just like a person, but that you can uh, tweak it so that it is definitively male sounding or female sounding. You can have it be so that the voice has an accent has a German accent or a French accent or uh, whatever. Uh, and you can you can play with the speed at which your script is read and all of these things that can can change it so that it just sounds like a person. It sounds like you went to a recording studio and said, hey, Bill and Stacy, would you do this thing for me? You know? Um, and I have encountered that same thing with writing. Um, I I read a thing, because I have read things where the English is broken or the sentence structure is weird, or uh, it uh, when you read through it, 
the the thoughts are not done in what would be a logical chronological order. I've seen the AI work done that way. But I read a thing where an AI was prompted to do an article about female radio announcers, female DJs, and talking about the perspective of that. And so I, I read the thing and the, at the top it said, this was generated by an AI. And then I read it and I had to think if I had not been told that an AI generated this, I would not have known that because it, ta it, it, it spoke about the issue from a position of personal experience uh, with anecdotal references. And it seemed very human. That is a major problem, though, too. And they've been talking about that in uh, various um, law and government aspects, is that AIs will just make stuff up. They will constantly just make things up and present it as, this is real. So that's a problem with it as well. But 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 we do that. <laughs> I mean, so, so I mean, they learned, I, they learned it from watching <laughs> us, <laughs> you know? My basic thing is again, it, it's a tool. Yeah. I know for a fact that one of the librarians here uses Chat GT to punch up her emails. Hmm. She'll run her email through it to correct grammar or use a different turn of phrase or something like that to make it cleaner and easier to read. And um, it works quite well for her. Hmm. I think that's again, the big thing. We'll find the areas where it, you know, truly benefits and enhances and you know, we're just going to have to work with the others and see where it goes. So, well, it's sort of uh, your your recent webinar. You had a you you had the thing about um, uh, not concentrating on weaknesses but focusing on strengths. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we can do that with the tools that are available to us. Yeah, where it's like, okay, yes, there are problems with this. But these are the things that it does really well. Let's use it for that. Yeah. One of the problems I think people are having is it's an exponential growth, though. I mean, yes, there are problems with it now. But will those problems exist 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Or will they just be magnified and they're even bigger problems? You know what I mean? Um, that's true as well. But um, I mean, they keep improving the programs over time. Um, yeah. So. I mean, I remember back in the day when you could put something in Google and it was like, wow, it found something for me. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And now Google is written by other programs. The algorithm for Google is written by other algorithms. And it's been that way for like 15 years now, which is just. Uh... <laughs> oh. Okay, I for one welcome our new it robot overlords. Um, but let's let's as, wrap as up long as they're programmed by the octopi, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> well, the only reason the octopi have taken over is they only lived for like three years, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's probably fortunate for us, yes. <laughs> um did you want to hit with community events? Yes, I have my hot off the presses from three hours ago that I printed off. Uh, if you have uh, any events you'd like us to mention, uh, or if you have any comments, questions, suggestions for us, please drop us a line, email library at msutexas.edu. Um, for more information about the things that I'm going to mention today uh, or other local activities, uh, you should check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage. Um, or the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. Uh, this month, our community theaters are providing some great family entertainment. The Wichita Theater is putting on the stage version of Disney's The Little Mermaid. And Backdoor Theater is staging Lightning Thief, the Percy Jackson musical. Um, also this month, the MSU Football Golf Tournament is July 28th. In August, the next uh, uh, After Hours Art Walk is downtown Wichita Falls on the 3rd. I'm kind of excited about this one. Uh, the Wichita Falls Museum of Art at MSU Texas is hosting a Lego printing workshop Thursday, August 10th and Saturday, August 19th. 
uh, participants will use Lego pieces and ink to make relief prints. Uh, the workshop is free and uh, all the materials are provided. Uh, the big bicycle race, the Hotter Hell 100, is at the end of August. Uh, and finally, although we will have more details soon, uh, please go ahead and start making plans to attend our October event, uh, Rooftop Heroes and Tabletop Terrors. All right. Back um, to you, uh, since Chris is not here, I would like to thank Jason Weber for being our guest. Is there anything you'd like to plug, uh, Jason? Is there anything you'd like to, to let people know that's upcoming that, uh, that they should be aware of or anything like that? So we've got our July training calendar out um, and I will, I'll make sure that you all have that as well. But, you know, every month we do a series of webinars. Uh, additionally, we do um, podcasts as well. So I would encourage everyone to take a look. If you just go to texastech.edu um, and under offices, you'll see uh, leader and culture development. We've got all of our stuff on there uh, as well. Any of the past webinars that you may have missed that you want to review, I post all of those on there. So you can view a recording and all of the resources, but very excited. Uh, the end of 23, beginning of 24, you know, we have a lot of really great things planned with MSU. And so I'm excited to be out there uh, building some programs and getting things going. So as always, if there are any questions or anything I can do to support, uh, you just let me know. All right. Okay. And I guess we're, we are uh, out for today. Uh, thank you for everyone for, for tuning in this week. We will be back uh, next month and uh, have a good day. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.